call to order, <coughs> call to order this special workshop for the Clarksville Connected Utilities Municipal Fiber Optic Internet. Philip. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Board. So I've asked uh, John Lester with the uh, Clarksville Connected Utilities, he's the general manager of that utility company, to uh, present to you tonight how the city of Clarksville went through their process of creating a citywide broadband. There's been a lot of discussion um, about uh, the broadband services that we have here in town, and the board has indicated in times past that there's some interest in looking at the city doing broadband uh, and trying to go down that road. So uh, John has a lot of uh, experience that. So with that, uh, John Lester, um, he uh, will walk you through his, his presentation and uh, he's got a lot of good information in there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm kind of excited to be in front of you today. So what we're gonna cover is uh, provide you as a leadership a perspective on our journey that we took to build a fiber to the home network. And the process we'll go through is we'll give you a little bit of my, uh, introduction from my background. We'll talk about Phil uh, Sharps, who's also with me, my technical services manager. We'll uh, talk about the background, what led up to it, and what, when, why, how, uh, some of the steps and milestones and the results that we've achieved thus far. What's in this for us is to be able to share the story with you because we think it's important for municipals to have innovative solutions to community issues and for you hopefully it's information to set a path whatever that path might be for you um, it's going to be something that hopefully you can uh, benefit from so if there are any questions as we go through don't hesitate to ask okay i usually move pretty quick so don't hesitate to say john got questions ask them okay okay a little bit about my background um, as philip said i'm the general manager of Clarksville Connected Utilities. I've been there since July of 2013. Um, in our unique case, we are owned by the city, but we have a totally separate utility board, okay? Um, we have electric, water, wastewater, and then the broadband utility. <coughs> uh, the reason why Philip and I get along so well is I'm a former city manager. So I'm actually, I, I tell him I'm a reformed city manager, okay? So I was a city manager in Chinook, Kansas, had about a $50 million budget. 160 employees, three unions. It was about as full service as you can get. Um, electric water, wastewater, you have a natu natural gas system and a broadband network. Uh, before that, I was a city administrator in Herman, Missouri, the wine capital of Missouri. Uh, before that, I was a member services coordinator for a power agency. I believe you buy a lot of your power from GRDA. There in a sense is a power agency, so I worked for an entity similar to that in Missouri where I was a member services coordinator. So I traveled the state. Uh, that particular agency had electric, natural gas, and provided uh, the trade association as well. So I was visiting city utilities in Springfield and then Crane, Missouri, all in the same day. So pretty wide perspective. Before that, I was a marketing director in my hometown of Crawfordsville, Indiana. If you've seen the movie Hoosiers years ago, when Gene Hackman was driving down to school, that was the road that I drove to school every day. The barbershop scenes where they're roasting the new coach, that little uh, town fed into the high school I went to. So you've seen that I grew up around a lot of corn. Before that, I spent uh, 10 years in the private sector, got a, a bachelor's degree from Ball State University, and I'm just a few credits short of my MBA. Another thing I like to tell Philip and other people is I was a perfect city manager because I have a BS degree from BSU. So. <laughs> A little bit about the utility. It's about 100 years old, uh, founded in 1913. At least that's as far back as the records go that we can find. Um, municipally owned, accountable to the community, all those services that I mentioned for. A separate utility board has really been that way since 1947, and it was created that way through ordinance from the city council. Okay? They still maintain, in our particular case, regulatory authority, in other words, we're totally autonomous and separate, but they appoint board members. Uh, if we have a rate adjustment, they're our public service commission. And also if we issue debt, they also have to approve that. So, but the bottom line is we have not-for-profit rates. We're about Main Street, Clarksville, and that's it. Okay. A little bit about the fiber network that started in 2016. Some of my predecessors did a very good job of taking care of the infrastructure and the assets and the balance sheet, but
but they weren't necessarily comfortable with technology. So what I found when I got there was there was really no step forward to automate some of the things that a lot of utilities had automated. In other words, installed SCADA systems, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So, so there was nothing like that in place. They had tried to make an attempt in 2011, a couple of years before I got there, but it really didn't go very well. So what I knew was we needed to step into the 21st century. So in order to do that, you have to have a way to touch and feel and communicate with those devices and you needed a communication mechanism. And that's why we ended up choosing fiber. It was strictly for utility purposes, okay? So as we get farther into this, what I want you to kind of put in your mind is every step we took, I used the seven habits of highly effective people with Stephen Covey. And the primary one that I used was number two, begin with the end in mind. As I talk through some of the things we did, I think you'll see where that was. In other words, if you can think about how it is today and what that future might be, it might make good economic sense to prepare for the future right up front. So begin with the end in mind. So our first step with the fiber network was to build a core. And I'm gonna show you a map of the core in a minute. Uh, it's 17 miles in a loop around the community. And the reason why we did that in loop is because you, you wanna create reliable and redundant type of system, okay? And the rings allow you to do that. It creates a, a mechanism where it's self-healing. We felt like this was just as important as electric was 100 years ago. People expect the lights on all the time and I guarantee if you ever had an outage on the internet, they're just as upset when it goes out. Um, what I'm saying with begin and the end in mind, if I just wanted to manage our fiber or our utility infrastructure alone, I would have only needed maybe 12 or 24 strands. But the incremental cost to add strands into a cable is nothing compared to the labor to install. So that's why we looked at different pricing and we ended up with going with uh, 288 ca uh, count fiber in the cable, which is a lot of capacity, a lot of capacity. At the same time, we started layering in the SCADA uh, electronics. We upgraded our IT system across the board, new servers, um, um, SAN arrays, and we also op uh, remodel our operations building preparing for the future. So when we were thinking about those applications beyond just our utility applications for managing the infrastructure, we also thought about how can we leverage this for voice over IP phone systems. Currently we had four or five different landlines coming into a particular building where you pay every month for each individual landline, but if you had one connection through a fiber, you could get rid of all those landlines and save a lot of money. So voice over IP systems, cloud applications, security systems, uh, power supply coordination, uh, and there's potential for smart city applications out there too. That was just internally for us not including some of the external value. And that's really part of the message when it comes to a fiber network from a municipal point of view is it's not just for the utility of the city, but there are other things that you can do to add value to the community in general. So education and training and COVID-19 certainly was a great display of the need for bandwidth. Uh, public safety, transportation, healthcare. Um, there are more and more people going online to see their primary care physicians with COVID-19. Um, accessibility for people, and yes, um, surfing faster and playing video games is a part of it, but the reality of it is on the, on the video play for TV, what's happening is more and more people are cutting the cord and using streaming devices like Roku and Netflix and those types of things. So traditional cable content is not quite the same as it used to be. But the biggest one for us was about economic development because if you have this as a tool, you have an extra tool that a lot of communities don't have. It may not be the reason why a business might locate to your community, but it may be the tiebreaker. And I can tell you in Chinook, Kansas, it was the tiebreaker for us. We ended up landing a company called Spirit Aerosystems that builds components for Boeing airplanes. So it was a tiebreaker in that particular case. So this is the network ring that I was talking about, or the core. The yellow highlighted areas kind of give you the idea of what the route is. In the upper right is where our network operations center, so basically all the electronics and brains are there. It goes across the east all the way over to the west side, 
where we have a redundant network operations center. We actually put that in one of our electric substations. We did that to try to keep them physically apart as much as we can. Why? If a tornado hits our network operations center, we're still going to be able to run with a backup. From a utility perspective, when I needed it the most is when we had to have it the most. That's why we built it that way. In our particular case, too, now that we're an internet service provider, we have three different connections to the outside world. So if one goes down, it rolls over to the other or rolls over to the other. So we really built it with the end in mind. So some of these screens show the SCADA system that we've implemented. On the left is electric. It hasn't been fully implemented yet. Um, there is some culture when it comes to electric distribution workers, when it comes to safety that we got to work through, but we'll get there. The intention is to apply smart grid applications to make our system more reliable. We'll get there. Our water system is fully automated. And here's what I mean by that. It is automated enough that my water treatment plant manager can literally run the distribution system and the water treatment plant from a smartphone and a deer stand. So that eliminated all over time and it really keeps things way more efficient than what we had before. But it's that communication mechanism that allowed us to do it. In that 288 cable, you're just going to see a cross section here. And what we did was, and we think this is a very unique application, that 288 cable, we dedicated buffer tubes in there for public purposes specifically. For example, the red and the black tubes are for us, 24. The gray tube is for public safety. The orange tube is for governmental purposes. And in that is the county and the city. White is for healthcare specifically. We thought that the hospital could interconnect with the clinics within its own network within this core cable and education. In our particular case, we have uh, uh, University of the Ozarks that is connected to our network and the school district and they each have their own dedicated network within this core. And that still left us 192 fibers in the core to do something else with. So as we really built this out, we thought it was important to add value and to start communicating with the anchor institutions. And you're going to see a step in the process that made it really clear. But right now, within that core, we already have 10 different networks within that core. Uh, our business in SCADA, the school districts, uh, Johnson County, City of Clarksville, and we've even added Clarksville Housing Authority in that they have their own network just for those uh, clients in their dwellings that may be economically challenged. They've got, they've got one bill where they're paying all for their customers in this particular case, and I think that's a unique application too. And then last is our ISP network. Oh, by the way, those anchor institutions by themselves generate at least about $250,000, $75,000 a year. And today I just inked a new contract with the school district where they're going to go from 10 gigs in their core interconnecting their building to 40. And that contract is going to jump from 43000 to $80,000. And when we did the original contract with them, they saved about $20,000 from the other provider they used to have. So just to give you a perspective of how you add value. The other thing we opted to do was once we set up an internet service provider network or ISP and we became official, we started to connect beta customers. So we had several businesses that we wanted to play with and kick the tires. And these were businesses that were friendly, so to speak. So they would tell us if there was an issue and wouldn't have a big problem with it. So. We even have a relationship with wholesale providers. In other words, uh, Ritter is a provider out of the Jonesboro area, kind of that region. They are all in other areas of the state too. And Pinnacle, which is out of Fort Smith, they have a retail uh, relationships with customers in town, and we're that last mile across the wire to get there. So the same type of scenario could happen with any major company. Let's say uh, Tyson works out an arrangement with Verizon and Verizon needs a last mile in they make contract with a municipal that has that fiber to provide that service in So to kind of give you a perspective Think of this as the transportation system or a tree Okay, that orange around the core that we talked about 
is the interstate system or the trunk of the tree. That's the high speed, low ramps, fundamental piece of this network that carries a lot of the traffic, okay? And when you build a fiber network, that's the core. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna build out the streets, which are the blue lines. So that's a distribution system. So that's the next piece. And that is what we've been in the process of doing since the fall of 19 or so. And then the most challenging thing is the drops to the houses, which are kind of like the leaves on the trees or the driveways. And that's what takes the longest. And that's the process we're in right now. When you design a fiber to the home application, you have uh, so you set up regions within the community that made sense from a demographic point of view, or not demographic, but geographic point of view. So you'll set up passive optical network cabinets where you connect each individual customer and that's what the push pin just kind of represents. In that cabinet, you can take one fiber to it and see the device at the middle there that looks like a credit card. You'll bring one fiber into that and it splits out of the backside 32 times. And that's what you end up connecting to that customer who gets service at the home or business. Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about the steps that we went through. And I probably went through more steps than some communities do because when I was in Chinook, Kansas, we had a lot of this set up and ready to go. And um, there was a small group that felt like it didn't make sense for them, okay? But I think if I would have gone through some extra steps, they would have looked at it slightly differently, okay? We did a basic feasibility study because we wanted to see whether the economics made sense just for our SCADA system and just for our business network applications. And then what we did is we reached out to the anchor institutions and asked them what their interest might be. Uh, they seemed to be very, very interested in it. Um, the next was, again, become the internet service provider and ISP. And that, again, allowed us to get our feet wet and make some mistakes. Next step after that, and I think this is a key, is we reached out to local IT professionals who were used to this technology and we brought them in as kind of an ad hoc committee to provide some leadership on what they thought this network could do, uh, what kind of models made sense, and there's a lots of different models out there from dark fiber, which is basically you put the outside plant up and let other people connect and transport, to you do it yourself all the way through, okay? So there's many different mixes and opportunities to build a model that makes sense for each community. We also had them look at what service offerings might make sense for Clarksville. So internet, voice is what they decided to go with or what they recommended to my commission in the beginning because they realized that cable TV, to set up a cable plant to deliver linear TV, it just didn't make sense with all the streaming that was starting to happen. So, but that was a unique recommendation they had. Uh, and then ultimately it was up for that group to say, the next step, or recommend the next step to the commission, and that would be go or no go. You'll see that there are two or three steps in these places where there's a, a point where you can literally say, does this make sense? Should we take the next step forward? Or should we just hold on at this point? So this would be one of that level. So they recommended to go. So they recommended to my commission to take that next step. And what the commission agreed to do is do a full design and master plan for building fiber to the home. And we wanted to do it in a way that would connect every single household because we might want to do smart grid applications and smart metering applications. We knew that we wouldn't necessarily get every single one as a customer, but we wanted to have the infrastructure planned for it. Uh, that gave us the cost to construct a full fiber network. Then what we did, and this is a key, is you don't want to let an engineering company who's done a design give you the recommendation from a business case because they still can benefit from the project if they go forward. Or you don't want to let a construction company who could do a business case do the business case for you. You want a completely independent third party. And that's what we did is we took all the cost, provided those to an independent third party who had nothing to gain uh, and we got real numbers that we knew we were comfortable with, which would allow us to say it makes sense or not. The other thing that we did is 
we decided to do a statistically valid market research to find out what the take rate would be for our project. In other words, if we're gonna roll this out, how many of our customers are actually gonna subscribe to this service? So rather than doing a um, paper survey or let somebody go online, we hired a marketing research company who would call customers in our database and ask them a series of questions. And um, it was 95% certainty level, plus or minus 3% as far as uh, margin of error. So we really felt like the results that they got were accurate. And they even did this. They looked at the demographics and seniors are more likely to answer the phone than some of the other younger ones. So they decided based upon the demographics, once they had a certain number of answers from the senior demographic, they wouldn't call anymore. So it was not only a statistically valid, but it matched the demographics of the community. Okay. Uh, based upon that, the community seemed very excited about us providing the service. They were not content with the incumbent providers. Um, and they even understood the value from an economic development point of view too. And we asked that specific question in the survey. And any of this information I'm talking about, we're more than happy to share with any municipal, uh, yourselves or, or anybody, as far as methodology to use. So the results indicated a high likelihood of success. In fact, we used 30% take rate makes our numbers work. We used 50%, but the survey results indicated it was possible to be upwards of 70%, believe it or not, when it comes to take rates. So the next question after that is go or no go, okay? So the question we all have to ask is, how do you wanna proceed? Do you want to issue debt for it? Is there multiple financing mechanisms? Do you wanna put it to a vote? And I believe in the state of Arkansas, now you'll have to consult a bond attorney, but I believe if it is a utility issue and you have utility revenue backing it, I don't think you're required to have the vote of the people. I think if you have a general obligation bond that might be tied to property taxes, I'm sure you do. But even if you don't with a revenue bond, you still may choose to have a public vote for them to decide whether to move forward or not. And I can tell you there's a lot of cities and other states where they have had popular votes and it has passed pretty well. So, so that's another no-go, go or no-go situation. Talked a little bit about bond attorneys. Um, our utility attorney was pretty smart. Uh, we use a guy named Jason Carter. I, th I think that uh, they represent the AMPA group, the 14 municipal electrics. And uh, what he said was, look, this is relatively new in the state of Arkansas for municipals to do this. Perigold and Conway kind of uh, paved our way. But even though the electric utilities, municipal electric utilities can build a network, we're still unsure whether it can be financed. So what Mr. Carter did was instead of hiring a bond attorney who'd have to spend all that time to figure out how it was gonna work, we did an RFQ to have them tell us how it was gonna work before we hired them. So uh, that ended up working well. So you contact an underwriter take action from the council or whatever, and um, sell the bonds. And I believe we sold the bonds in about $9 million in about two hours. So it went pretty quick. So the next steps after that is now we've got money, now we're gonna build, okay? We had two choices there. Do we do a traditional project where the engineers design everything and you bid everything out and you buy the, you hire the lowest contractor and then you get change orders or do you do with a non-traditional negotiated bid, kind of a design build? I'm not gonna talk about that much because I think that you've done projects that way. With that, you can get a guaranteed maximum price with your contractor rather than have to worry about, worry about change orders. Um, the reason why I like it is because you're finding a particular contractor that's gonna be with you to solve a problem. And I also like it because well, they got one throat to choke if there's a problem. Their responsibility is to manage everybody else. So we had to select a uh, general contractor. Then it's electronics. It's a very unique niche type business. 
and each one has their own strategy as far as marketing and where they produce. You'll want to go through that process to decide what equipment you want to provide if you do fiber to the home. The other thing that we did was we knew that there was going to be a lot of movement and a lot of activity and a lot of time constraints. So we ended up using a party where we could sole source all of the parts and pieces. You cannot possibly imagine how many thousands of piece parts and managing inventory there is. So we thought if we chose one that actually has a national buying power agreement that's approved with the state procurement agency, uh, it happens to be Graybar, we thought that'd simplify, and it did. Uh, then what you need to do is look at operations software and your billing software. Probably the software provider you have right now for your utility billing may not have it integrated to do uh, phone service or internet service in any way, shape, or form. So there's other parties out there that specialize in it. So you're going to have to find out who they are. You have to find out how long it would take to go through a process. Some of them, because <coughs> the market is just crazy right now with building, uh, they're a couple of years out just to integrate you but they can take that data and probably pass it up to your existing party. One of our drivers was we wanted one bill for all of the services that we provided. Then we built a uh, distribution network. We started out in the fall of 2019. Frankly, this went a lot faster than we expected. We only took about a year to do this. But one of the things that did surprise us is doing something called Make Ready. And I'm sure Glenn knows it well. No matter how clean you think your poles are that you own, somebody's put stuff in places that it shouldn't be. Or if you want to put one more wire in there, you got to put a bigger pole. So that is all getting your infrastructure ready to put the fiber in. That ended up being about $600,000 in our particular case, which kind of surprised me a little bit. But it's just something you factor in up front. But the construction process itself is also a great marketing opportunity because you've got contractors all over town. And what we did is we took our logo and slapped it onto our vehicles. Um, again, the biggest challenge is doing the drops to the driveways. And what we opted to do is rather use contractors to do the home install, we particularly chose to put our own installers and our own people in because we thought that nobody could service the customer better than we could. Um, what I would tell you is another piece of this is this is a 24-7, 365 <coughs> venture if you're the service provider. If somebody's game goes out at 3 o'clock in the morning, they want service right now. So you have to put in place probably a help desk. And what I mean by help desk is technical support that they can call 24-7. What we opted to do is we've outsourced that to a third party in the very beginning. There are multiple parties that do that. And it's just very transparent. Uh, they answer the phone, Clarksville Connected, when it goes through that. But we, what we intend to do long term, because it's about local economics and local jobs, is with the University of the Ozark, we probably got some kids who would love to spend 2 o'clock in the morning doing their homework, waiting for a phone call. So we'll probably stand up our home help desk eventually. And last but certainly not least is your own internal staffing. Um, you got electric linemen that can pull wire. That's an easy thing. Um, fiber splicers, you've got a community college in this area that taught our guys how to do splicing, at least some of the early ones. We've actually repurposed some of our water and sewer guys. So it's something that could be done. And some of them really like the fact that it's a little different than being in the ditch. Uh, installers, you would be amazed at how many employees there are for big telcos and big cable companies who are looking for some consistency in their life that a municipal could offer. I have no problem getting texts. They're knocking on my door saying, can we work for you? So that's a big concern for a lot of parties is where do we get the skill set? It's easier than you might think. And then for us, the biggest challenge might not be for you because you've got a four-person IT staff, but the people who can make the electronic boxes sing. So we had a third party that we outsourced ours to in the beginning. We ended up hiring that individual. And then we used some uh, more complicated layer three technicians. So the other thing that's important, if you're going to achieve that 30% take rate, 
is you've got to market, market, market. We put a online ordering system in place when we first started our construction. And we had, believe it or not, we have enough orders, 1,300 from our 4,300 meters, that I've already got a 30% take rate. Now we gotta get them installed. And I can tell you, everybody's very impatient when it comes to wanting their internet service now. That's the biggest challenge that we have, right, Phil? Yeah. Is mitigating people's expectations because they want it right away. We did Facebook posts, we did radio shows and radio ads. Uh, one of the things that sometimes municipals aren't too good about is advertising and marketing. You gotta be good at advertising and marketing, but I don't think that the city of Salem Springs will have that problem. Um, so it's about marketing, public relations, sales. Again, the biggest danger is managing expectations. Everybody wants it today. So for us, we think there's a huge value in local ownership and local control, just on like the electric utility. Uh, I think that customers are pretty happy with what they're getting so far. Um, and I think we'll get to that 50% take rate in a reasonable amount of time. So this is our pricing model, okay? And it's one simple price, all the equipment, free installation with that price. For a 100 meg service, symmetrical. All these are symmetrical, so the download speed and the upload speed is the same. And that's more important with video learning and things like that than ever before is $45 a month. For 250, $65, 500 megs, 80 bucks, a thousand megs or a, a, a gig is $90. And we also order, uh, offer phone service for 20 and 25. And then you see the business package is 100 for 59 and it goes up to uh, about 9.99 for uh, a gig. And uh, we also offer phone too. And what you'll find is if you go down this path and you end up being the retailer, the reason why it makes sense for phone is specifically if you're gonna get a business account they want one provider for internet and phone, so they'll switch both over that way. So, John, you yeah. you include in that forty-five dollars the the modem. Yes, but there's not a separate rental fee. No, it's not. This is what you get for the speed plus this plus this plus this. It's forty-five dollars for a hundred meg, and we actually have a network that's called a software-defined network. So if you say, I'm, you know, I love your hundred meg package, but I'm I've got some kids coming over or grandkids are coming, whatever the situation is, I wanna raise it to 500 while they're here. We can literally with a keystroke raise it from one gig or uh, from 100 to one gig. So the other thing that we did in our package or our solution is every engineer that we talked to that did these designs said, nobody ever comes back to us and says, we put too much fiber in. They all say, we wish we would have. So that's why we did the 288 plus on the distribution network, whatever that original design was on the fiber count, we went up to the next size because nobody knows what that next application is gonna be. Again, kind of the begin with the end in mind philosophy. So, so far with our ordering patterns, we've installed about just under 300 customers. Our business case made the assumption that 65% of the customers will get the 100 package, the slow one, well, the slowest one. 25% would get 250, 5% would get the 500 meg, and 505% would get the one gig, but this is what we're actually getting in results, okay? 45% are getting the slowest package, 28% getting the 250, but 22 getting the gig package. So really, there are people who are spending more to get that speed than what we ever expected. So that's just going to make the business case look that much better. So since the biggest challenge is getting installs, we put a matrix together. Uh, we have about 3,300 customers. Uh, we've already got just under 1,300 orders. We've got the drops or the, the driveways, 929 done. You have to splice them because you actually have to test to make sure you've got a circuit from the customer's home all the way back to where your electronics are. You've got to have a clear path, so we've spliced and tested. Uh, we've got 295 ready to be installed, and we've already got 327 on this particular sheet that are, are being built. So 
So not too bad since we started install installation last fall and we've all been living with COVID. Now, here is a slide that I shared with Philip and he wanted me to get more conservative than what I was. Even though I thought my numbers were realistic, I understand where he's coming from. So think about this from a local economics point of view, economics 101. If you have 8,400 meters and 65% of the cons consumers in Xylem Springs has high-speed internet, that's 5,426. If you can save them $25 or you partner with somebody who can save them $25 that stays in their pocket, that's $136,000 a month that stays in Silent Springs. Times 12, that's $1.6 million that stays in their pocket. In our case, our cable company is act actually owned by a conglomerate in Portugal, and that's not Portugal, Arkansas. So those dollars staying in Clarksville, these dollars would stay in Silent Springs, and there's an economic multiplier when it comes to keeping money locally where it just rolls through the community. So I normally use 5%. Philip said, let's be conservative. Let's take it down to three times multiplier. So the economic benefit for you or partnering with somebody who could help customers spend $25 less a month is just under $5 million. That's a pretty big impact. Pretty big impact. So our play was we needed to differentiate our community, so we needed to set ourselves up to be more forward thinking. It was about sustainability, affordability, efficiency, um, local ownership, and utility infrastructure is critical. You guys are in very good shape when it comes to utility infrastructure. Um, but what's coming is the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things basically is if you think about jobs today, a lot of them have gone overseas. But economics is still going to work where the cost of labor is going to go up and those companies are going to decide to onshore those facilities again, but it's never going to be people building and doing things. It's going to be people feeding, monitoring, and managing machines that are connected. So that's why we really felt like for us doing a fiber to the home or fiber network was it critical because those high-tech businesses were going to need that connectivity. Questions? Did I go through that too fast? No, I, I think you did fine. I, I would ask you just, um, this is one way to do this, and, and I would like to maybe take a minute, ask you to take a minute and just talk about what other options cities might have and what other ways to do something similar. Right. So if you really think about it, cities have been building roads and bridges since cities existed, okay? Building a fiber network or a telecommunications network is no different. There's lots of different models when it comes to this. You might decide to build the infrastructure and provide what they call dark fiber. So dark fiber is the plant that's up in the air that you let somebody else lease and turn on basically and start providing the signal. That's option number one. Option number two might be you want to put the electronics in to light the fiber and provide transportation services to, for somebody who wants to retail the product over your infrastructure. In other words, you're kind of a wholesale provider of services, and there could be a retail provider of services. In fact, another potential model is, and this model's been used in Utah through an entity called Utopia, which is a conglomeration of multiple cities where you provide what's called open access. You have multiple providers on your one network where a customer can literally turn on their display screen and say, I want to go with broadband provider X today and then switch to provide broadband provider Y tomorrow. Because the limitation of the bandwidth is hardly any at all. I mean, it's the speed of light. So that's a possibility. And there's all kinds of combinations in between. For example, on our network, for us, it made the most sense from an economic point of view to be the retail provider, but we don't provide the backroom telephone switch. It didn't make sense to do that. We're actually buying that service and reselling it to somebody else or to our customers. So there's lots of different models, and that's why we put that ad hoc committee together because we wanted them to look at what models made sense and kind of make a recommendation. 
Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. Okay. What other questions? It's just a scenario. I don't know if you price. It's just a scenario. You might want to change some. They, a provider might come out with a special package that another provider doesn't have. You might switch for that reason. Um, I understand. Mm-hmm. Yes. We've got a great relationship with our school, and I'm absolutely sure you do with your school, too. When COVID happened, when we did the arrangement with the school district, I mean, you've got so much flexibility to work terms out that make sense for you and your customers that when we lit their dedicated network up, we allowed them 25 access points. And here's what I mean by that. They may have had nine structures that they wanted to connect, but they had a vision of putting hotspots around the community where there might be kids who couldn't afford it at home that could go to that spot and connect directly to the school's network. They put four of those hotspots in, in specifically when COVID happened. Very smart, yeah. So U of O um, has their dedicated 10 gigs around their ring. And they even have all their student traffic in their dorms separate from their administration traffic, which is pretty smart too. Don, what's your population of your city? Just under 10,000. Just under 10,000. Under 10,000? Yes, sir. Good. What did you guys have before this? Did you have Cox and CenturyTel? And Our two incumbent providers are CenturyTel, CenturyLink, and SuddenLink. Suddenlink? Suddenlink's a cable provider. Okay. They're the ones owned by Altice. This is out of Portugal. Oh. So you're doing internet service and phone, but not TV cable? Nope. Okay. If it wasn't for COVID-19, we'd be having streaming workshops at the high school two or three times a month. Well, when the city first looked at this in the late 90s, that was the lead, was right. cable. And internet was pie in the sky but coming and then of course the tv cable has been dying but there's everybody's cutting the cord because yeah, yeah. i i think that there's a time where if you just want to watch the razorbacks baseball games you can subscribe to just the razorbacks baseball games pay for that one thing yep when will you guys have this um project paid for it'll be year 10 10th year yep and that's why a large investor owned incumbent typically don't spend money in small communities because they're looking at three to five years at the most, whereas our mission's different. So if we get a 50% take rate, it's just under 10 years. When you, when I, when you showed us our, the, uh, the charge, charge, uh, your cost, uh, to the customer, um, you have residential and then business. Um, what would you do for small business that has like one to five employees? It, it seems kind of high on some of the business pricing when, when sometimes the small business that only has a few employees are struggling to keep the business open more than they are to keep their own home open. <laughs> I so, understand. So I, I didn't know if that was something you'd considered was having a, a small business rate or well, we, we looked at the existing pricing structure from, from the incumbents. From what they're... Right, and, and what you have to remember is they sell the bandwidth at one price and then there's an extra X 10 bucks a month for the router. And then right. if you really want a dedicated IP address, you got to pay extra for that. This is all one price. So, and we tried to keep it as simple as we could. What we had really been excited about when we had looked at it in 2012 was that our own electric department was going to run it because they have such a good reputation for keeping the electric on if it ever goes off that they would quit.
quickly be able to get the the broadband back up if it went down and so people get pretty frustrated with the ones I, that are here i understand in fact that was one of the major things that came out in that statistically valid survey is you know we asked a second survey and the one we asked a question about motivation for switching 70 percent of the customers would switch just to have somebody to talk to on a local basis instead of a recording yes exactly the, the biggest complaint i get and we saw it in the early 2000 well mid 2000s 2009 10 11 was the increase every year in price with no change in service and we still get that complaint as if we have some control over it but uh, that's frustrating I understand it, depending upon how what model you chose you might have some direct influence on what that pricing is have you guys had to raise your price yet or, or do you think you will I don't think I will in fact after year five or seven um, the margin on this is going to be better than our my electric department that's saying a lot John, who did your survey? We used a company out of Utah called SDS. And the reason why we used them is all the way back to me working for my hometown utility in Crawfordsville, Indiana. We used to do, uh, and it was a municipal, we used to do customer satisfaction surveys and they did that there. So it was about relationships. I picked up the phone and called. And uh, are you familiar with Hometown Connections? They used to work with Hometown Connections. And the other value that I had with using them specifically is they had done enough of these that they could compare our data to other cities. Thank you, John. You're welcome. John, I have a question uh, concerning how are you working things for the future, meaning technology changing and whatnot? You have extra cable right now, but uh, you must have confidence in that, uh, th that the cable is going to be uh, your best solution for a good while. Fiber optic network cable uh, has been really in place for 30, 40, 50 years. In fact, Phil, come on up. Phil, he was one of my best steals. He, he spent many, many years in the telecom business. And he actually worked for the, the telecom engineer that uh, we used we put our SCADA network in but there's fiber plant that's been in place for well, 30 my father worked for Southwestern Bell out of that the first fiber optic cable went in in 1978 it's still being used today it really does we don't know what the lifespan right. is as of yet so there's there's no moving parts and what you're doing is you're shining a light through a piece of glass so the lifespan on it is unknown at this time yes and the value of having that unlimited resource in that strand of glass is as the electronics get better you take this box off the end and you put a new one on that probably does three times more for half the price so we've got it confidence in it then i do the, the question i always get the most is what about 5g they're going to have these cells everywhere and you're not going to need fiber well, you would almost think that it could cure cancer with all the advertisements that you see on TV, but here's the reality. Right now, go ahead and explain all the right. difference. So, your 4G LTE tower that you see sitting on top of the hill. Speak into the mic. Yes, sir, sorry. Your 4G LTE tower that you see sitting on top of the hill that spans about 10 miles, okay? 5G goes 750 feet. Every single one of those nodes has to be fed with fiber. So for 5G to work, it has to be connected to fiber. You're going to have to have that fiber plant somewhere. A car moving 60 miles an hour, those 5G have to go from 750 foot to 500 foot spacing so that you'll be able to have the handoffs just like you do on your cell towers. So that might be another revenue opportunity for the city. If you own that infrastructure, you could lease it out to some of the big providers good question I'll, I'll, I'll 
tell you, I'm afraid of that mic's being so close. I'm going to already sit right there so I can hear it. Uh, it's a no-brainer. It's probably the first time in a while that I started getting texts. Uh, not that you're interested in that I was late, but I was catching up on my text. And, uh, you know, it's nothing but uh, positive. I think it's a feedback when we tried to do it before. I think the community's starving for a, a reduced cost and an additional revenue stream. It's just a question on how we navigate that. Uh, I think it's a no-brainer. So, uh, well, be prepared. The incumbents aren't going to want to lose their business. Well, that's all right. So we will, you will compete on price probably in some fashion, but the bottom line in the end is local service. You actually answer the phone, people are shocked. When you solve a problem in five minutes, people are shocked. But you're right. I mean, you guys got a re great reputation. If you did the survey, I think you'd see that. You know, amazingly enough, this for us, no. And part of the process you have to go through is um, public notice and public comment period. And I posted two public notices and we had our comment period and nothing. I was honestly surprised. That's very interesting because that's, that was one of our biggest challenges before was. I had the same, I had the same issue in Chinook, Kansas. I'm familiar with Chanute because I'm from Kansas, so. Oh, I know okay. Where is. <laughs> I had fun five years there. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Welcome. You're welcome. Any other questions? Great group. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, John. I appreciate it, Phil. Appreciate you. So, board, I, in the discussion of you know, we've just kind of bounced this idea around, and I, I think. As John alluded to, there are obviously in, in there's multiple different options. I think the two biggest options that keep um, sort of bubbling to the surface at the staff level is doing something similar like Clarksville did, which is we are the retail provider. You have to have the 24/7, 365 degree help you know network. You have to have a, a warehouse full of modems. You have to have additional staff, and then that other option is. Uh, something that may be s like something we've already done uh, just recently where we entered into, um, it's a little different, but we entered into an agreement with the school where we would run the fiber and then they would use a third party and, and you know, have the internet. So the, that using that model, the, the other option might be that we provide the highway system, the tree, as John said, the trunks and the branches and the leaves, but we're not the retail provider. We lease that infrastructure out to a retail provider. So I think if there is interest, um, you know, I, I would ask you to just go back. I don't want an answer today, but maybe in two weeks uh, we can have some discussion during board reports and, and administrators reports about if you're interested in us maybe creating at least a very broad uh, uh, way of moving forward before we get really into the into the the depths of it but i think if that's the interest of the board then you know us reaching out to some of the experts uh, in the city as it relates to internet and trying to create some ad hoc advisory committee of uh, helping us to kind of follow this plan and and as john said you get to you know decision points whether it's no go or go or whether it's this path or this path, and, and eventually bringing it back to the board and making some recommendations from there. So um, I, I do believe, John talked about all the various reasons why, I, I think COVID has shown us some reasons why, but I think uh, if, if the board wishes to go down this road, from my perspective, it's truly an economic development tool. Uh, as John said, I think uh, companies will be coming back eventually and um, to set ourselves apart, uh, we know everything's moving to the internet. We know everything is moving to online. And to me, this is not much different than in the 20s and 30s when we talked about rural electrification of communities. This is what we need to do as cities to move us into the 21st century. We're still early in the 21st century, and we're going to have to take advantage of doing this and, and um, in my opinion, making us making ourselves relevant relevant if that's what 
the community and the city wants to do. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Board. Thank you. <laughs> Philip, can I ask a question? So when you say look at other avenues besides us doing the retail, I feel like that's loud. Sorry. Um, how do we keep the cost down if we're not doing the retail? Well, it's a good question, and, and I think that's one of the pros and cons we have to look at. Um, I think, you know, some of those answers we have, to, or some of those questions we have to answer first is why are we doing this? We are doing this for revenue, then maybe doing the, being the retail entity is what we want to do. Both of those models, I think, would answer the question if we're doing this to provide better service at a potentially lower cost. We're doing it for an economic development purpose. Purpose. Both of those models would answer that question. Um, I think there's some opportunities there to to work with a third party retailer that we could maybe have some control over cost, uh, but you do lose some authority to truly regulate the cost. And so I think you just have to weigh all those things out. I don't know the answer perfect. I don't know how to answer that question perfectly yet because I haven't studied the whole thing but I do think if you go the other route there may be some avenues to to work on that but you still you lose the the full control yes in my opinion if we keep the cost down like you said we're keeping the money in our community and the only way to do that is to govern it well I I think uh, I don't want to go I don't want to show all the cards yet mm -hmm. but I think there's some opportunities to possibly have discussions with third-party providers who are low-cost providers that are good providers where we could say as long as you continue to provide service to Salem Springs residents at the rate that you're providing and required to provide to other customers uh, then there's a way to maybe keep that so that we're not different from from other customers that this company might provide. And I know we're short on time, but I do have one more question. Sure. So I worked here, and um, Carl Thomas Thompson started the fiber. He started putting city the fiber around the city, and then we contracted with Protocol, and I was part of that, we, where we were installing fiber around the city. Can that current infrastructure be used, or are you guys looking at? Because I, I, I don't remember what strands we put in. That, and that would be the question. You, you know, I, I mean, I think. Um, when we did uh, some time ago, we did a lease of dark fiber to Cobb, and we had some discussion internally. And I think we even said it at the board meeting. And, and Phil would, Phil or Glenn would remember how many strands we put in. I don't remember, but there was a discussion of we could just buy the minimum 12 strands, or we could buy the 24 strands, or we could buy the 36 strands. We did something more. We didn't do 288. Um, so. You, you know, if it's 12 strands, I, I would say we probably, we might be able to use it, but it's not sufficient for the future. So uh, that's I just I couldn't remember the numbers, so yeah. I was wondering if you did, but okay. Thank uh, you, Lord. Philip, on, on our current fiber system now, uh, Mark Latham was the administrator when we looped the whole city. Um, does other internet service providers access the fiber optic does Cox or Century or anybody pay us to get on our fiber or they don't pay us to get on our fiber what we've done to my knowledge and Glenn you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong and please do uh, to my knowledge at least in the in the time that I've been here we have we have strung fiber and we've leased it to a company like Cox or excuse me like Cobbs uh, or maybe Day Springs, and they have contracted out with a provider. So we've provided the we've provided the highway, but we didn't provide the connection at point A and point B. Okay, so Cox may be running across that for the purposes of Day Spring or Cobbs or whoever, Cobb, but we don't have the the lease of our fiber to Cox. Does that make sense? Did we sell the? cable or the optic no i think we leased it we lease it to Cobb or whoever okay thank you well it is almost 6 30 uh board thank you mr lester thank you for your information and your presentation uh we will adjourn this workshop and re-adjourn for our regular board meeting we are adjourned
it's all it's all well, what day? all right we we're gonna get started here call to order this meeting of the silent springs board of directors for march 16 2021 roll call Tappington here smiley here burns here hunt here Rissler here allen here carol here all stand with me while Director Smiley leads us in prayer and then remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Father, we are so thankful for all the blessings that you have provided for our community. It's been such a, a great day for everybody to be outside. Spring is on its way. I pray for your guidance and direction in the decisions we are about to make for our community. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve our community. Please watch over our community, our nation, and all those that serve us wherever they may be. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation and wide, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I would ask that uh, all electronic devices be silenced, please. And thank you. At this time, uh, it is the public may address the Board of Directors regarding any item on the consent agenda or any city business not listed on the board's regular agenda. Is there anyone here that would like to speak at this time? If there is not, we will move to the consent agenda. And I will at this time remind all board members that we need you to please speak into the mic so that we are getting everything recorded. Thank you. Our consent agenda, item A, workshop minutes from March 2nd, 2021. Item B, regular meeting minutes, March 2nd, 2021. Item C, purchase, public works department, solid waste division, 2022 walking floor trailer from Ken's Truck Repair, $85,000. This is a budgeted item. Item D, grant application and grant offer, the Community Development Department, Airport Division, Federal Aviation Administration Airport Coronavirus Response Grant Program in the amount of $13,000. This is a grant. Do I hear a motion to approve, or is there any item that you would like to have pulled? Madam Mayor? Yes. I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. Riley? Yes. Burns? Yes. Hunt? Yes. Rissler? Yes. Allen? Yes. Carroll? Yes. Sappington? Yes. Motion is approved. At this time, we'll move on to our regularly scheduled items, our ordinances. First item is Ordinance 21-02. This will be the third reading for vacation of an unnamed rights-of-way, 316 North Heiko Street. And Ben, will you turn? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the board and Ben Rhodes, Senior Planner. Uh, before you is the third and final reading for the uh, alleyway closure occurring at the Simmons Food Facility at 316 North Pico Street. Um, there have not been any additional comments since the uh, previous reading, and we stand ready for any of your questions. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to make a comment at this time? If not, directors, comments, questions? There being none, uh, I would accept a motion to place Ordinance 20-02 on its third reading, suspending the rules and reading title only. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Burns? Yes. Hunt? Yes. Whistler? Yes. Allen? Yes. Carroll? Yes. Sappington? Yes. Smiley? Yes. Motion is approved. Philip? Ordinance number 2102, an ordinance vacating and abandoning certain rights of way within the C.D. Gunter's edition, number one, City of Salem Springs. 
this time, I'll accept a motion to adopt Ordinance 21-02. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Hunt. Yes. Rissler. Yes. Allen. Yes. Carroll. Yes. Sappington. Yes. Smiley. Yes. Burns. Yes. Motion to adopt is approved. Next item is Ordinance 21-03. Wait a minute. Did Philip read the ordinance? Yes, yeah. I did. Okay. Thank you, sure. Mm -hmm. Back. <laughs> ordinance 21-03, second reading, amending section 102-21 of the city municipal code, rezoning from A1 to R2, 813 Arkansas Highway 16. Ben? Yes, uh, thank you again, Madam Mayor and Board. Uh, before you is the uh, second reading for the uh, rezoning request, as the mayor stated, at 813 South, uh, Arkansas Highway 16. Uh, the rezoning is of the, the rear acreage that's going from uh, A1 to R2 single family. Uh, we've not received any uh, comments since the uh, first reading, and we stand ready for any real questions. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to make a comment or a question? Being none, directors, no one. Sir, do you have? Just please state your name, your address, and you will have three minutes. Uh, my name is Jake Chavis. I'm representing the owner and Bates and Associates. I will be the engineer on this project. Um, since there are no public comments, we haven't heard anything yet. Um, I ask that um, you do the second and third reading in this session. Yes. I really think on, I would like to separate those out for the second and third reading separately, but is there a reason why you want to do that? Just is so the time element? Just so the developer can, can get started sooner uh, and we can see this at Planning Commission sooner. Lord, what is your pleasure? I agree with Carol. I, I don't like doing a second and third or whatever if if we can help it just because we need to be serving the public and making sure that everyone has said anything that they may need to and it's two more weeks so i don't see a problem waiting do i hear a motion to place ordinance 21-03 on its second reading, suspending the rules and reading title only. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Rissler? Yes. Allen? Yes. Harold? Yes. Sappington? Yes. Smiley? Yes. Burns? Yes. Hunt? Yes. Motion is approved. Philip? Ordinance number 21-03. An ordinance amending section 102-21 of the Solemn Springs Municipal Code City Zoning Map, rezoning from A1 to R2 property located at 813 Arkansas Highway 16. Next item is ordinance 21-04, second reading, amending chapter 102, floor to area ratio, Ben. Yes, thank you again, Madam Mayor, members of the board. Uh, before you is the uh, second reading of the code change to remove the floor to area ratio from the uh, residential zone districts and to also amend the H1DT overlay district with the same rule. Um, as a reminder, this, uh, this is a rule that we have found to be superfluous uh, due to the um, lots having lot coverage and height restrictions, um, which are already in the code. Uh, we've not received any additional comments on this since the first reading, and we are available for any questions. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that has a comment or question? Board? There being none, do I have a motion to place Ordinance 21-04 on its second reading, suspending the rules and reading title only? So moved. Second. Okay. Have a motion and a second. Roll call. Allen? Yes. Carroll? Yes. 
Sappington? Yes. Smiley? Yes. Burns? Yes. Hunt? Yes. Chrysler? Yes. Motion is approved. Philip? Ordinance number 21-04, an ordinance amending Chapter 102, Zoning Code of the Municipal Code with respect to floor area ratio. Next item is Ordinance 21-05, first and only reading for the Boys and Girls Club Sporting Programs. This is a sole source for $85,000. Don? Thank you. Madam Mayor, Board, Don Clark, Community Development Director. Um, before you tonight for your consideration is an ordinance for a contract to sole source with the Boys and Girls Club for $85,000. <clears> so um, I believe that we have, the city has worked with the Boys and Girls Club from our knowledge for at least 25 years. Um, just to give a little bit of background, um, in 2014, we then entered into a contract for services with the Boys and Girls Club to be in um, to be in accordance with the state statute that was updated that said that cities had to um, have an agreement for services with entities that they were working with. So just want to give that little bit of background before I started into um, talking about what they provide. So we, the city of Salem Springs and through the Boys and Girls Club offers a variety of youth sports um, to, to mention basketball uh, for both boys and girls football flag football for both boys and girls, cheerleading, volleyball <clears throat> as well. So when we started working with the Boys and Girls Club back in 2014, we did attempt to bid this out. Um, I believe in 2014 we bid it out and we received no bids um, from anybody other than the Boys and Girls Club. And we feel like they're uniquely qualified to provide this along with the other um, services they provide to, the to children in this area that are like after school programs and summer programs as well. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club had the staffing to be able to provide these, um, these um, recreational sports to, the, to children in our area. They also have the facilities for some of these that we don't have. Um, also back in 2014, staff was requested by the board to kind of look at if we could do this internally and it was quickly determined that for the amount of money that we could contract with the Boys and Girls Club, we couldn't reach that. It would cost us a lot more plus we don't have the facilities um, outside of the facility use agreements we have with some entities around to provide those opportunities. So um, staff feels like this is a, a, a good partnership with the Boys and Girls Club to provide an outlet for physical fitness and sportsmanship for children's, uh, excuse me, kids in Salem Springs. Um, so staff is requesting sole source due to the reasons that, you know, I kind of mentioned tonight uh, to where we are for <clears throat> to allow us to be in accordance with Arkansas state statute and city um, code to provide this contract with the Boys and Girls Club. The fiscal impact is that this would be an $85,000 a year um, agreement with the Boys and Girls Club that we were enter into for a period of three years. Um, staff is available for any questions. Um, we recommend approval. Thank you. Anyone in the audience that has comments or questions? There being none, director? Madam Mayor? Yes. Um, I know what Don just stated really summarizes it well, um, but the relationship between the city and the Boys and Girls Club well, goes well into the past before 2014, and uh, the reasoning has always been that we as a city cannot provide all of the fantastic opportunities that Boys and Girls Club does and that we are actually getting a heck of a deal contracting with them to do everything that they do. And as a former board member, I can tell you, they have dedicated staff, they have a heck of a leader uh, that's been there a long time. And I'd just like to read this, this letter that went to our board January 28th, dear, David Descenda and I would like to personally thank you for making our work possible in 2020 and beyond. And I believe this went to all the board members. The kindness of the city of Salem Springs in the past year supported our efforts in providing children with a safe place during out of school times, access to daily snacks, sport programs, learning support, and mentors. Even with COVID-19 restrictions, you helped us to provide 667 pe young people with a safe place to go after school and during the summer provide 722 children with an opportunity to participate in a variety of sports leagues, 
connect 1,295 kids with trained youth development professionals and adult volunteers who care, provide enriching programs, experiences, and opportunities for 1,431 children, provide 8,650 snacks to children, and provide 982 educational take-home packs to children in Western Benton County. Your generosity compelled us to look beyond the challenges of COVID-19 and to really focus on our core mission of encouraging and enabling all young people to reach their full potential as productive, caring, and responsible citizens. As we look ahead to 2021, we have an opportunity to continue to work together and increase our full support and heart into putting children on the path to success by creating great futures for the youth we serve together. I know they have a very dedicated board uh, a large board, as it should be, of a good variety of people. And um, a again, I'll say, uh, if anybody uh, around the community uh, doesn't understand the value we receive, just start asking questions. I will be glad. And, and many others around the community know for a fact my children were a part of it. Um, it's, it's very uh, important to the community. And we do get our money's worth trust me thank you madam mayor yes. i too want to offer my support for the boys and girls club i think it's a wonderful opportunity for our citizens and their children if you haven't visited just their facility it is a magnificent facility their staff is great there is a place for these children to come and feel like they have a home if they're having problems where they are and I just want to offer my support for this program. I don't remember what our contract was for last year. Do you remember what, was it the same amount? Yes, ma'am. So we passed it in 2018. So it was for 85,000. Oh, I didn't think we had increased it. Why, why did, Don, why did this not get done earlier at the end of the year with the other organization contracts? Like the museum and the Main Street and stuff? Uh, it, it expires in this month. So it's when we had it, yes, sir. I, I didn't know if there was some reason. That's a good question. Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, question of clarification. Um, you mentioned the relationship between the, the city and the Boys and Girls Club for 25 years, but then was it the con contractual obligation that was instituted in 2014? Well, so I'll what speak. What was the difference between the 25 years and the 2014? Well, before we just. Uh, they just did it and didn't get the money for it. No, they got the money. We oh. just didn't have a formal, formal service contract okay. with them. Got I believe it. that there was a, um, I don't want to speak out of turn, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, you may know. I think it was a, uh, something that came out of uh, light with the Little Rock, City of Little Rock and its chamber for not having a contractual basis that everybody, it kind of compelled everybody to make sure you had those service contracts. So at that point in time, when we started working with them, um, during that period, we went ahead and went to a service contract instead of just, you know, kind of giving them the money, so okay. to speak. Um, so I want to concur with what the other directors have said. And as a, a parent whose um, son went through some of the programs there, I can certainly appreciate um, what the Boys and Girls, Girls Club does. I think it's a, a very important a service, uh, important for us to be able to invest in the, the citizens or the, the, the kids in this community. And if that's something that the, the city is not able to do on our own, but can contract with the people that do have the training, do have the staff, do have the, the experience to do that. I think it's something that we most definitely need to do, invest in, in our youth right now. So I am very supportive of, of this continued relationship. Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, as a neighbor to the Boys and Girls Club, I get to see every day what goes on over there. And during the summertime when they're doing the meals uh, for breakfast and they're marching them over to the middle school to get their lunch or breakfast or whatever for the day, um, you can just see that the kids are just relaxed and they're enjoying what they're doing. And it's just a blessing to see because, I mean, I've counted and I've had to quit counting because I cannot tell you how many kids. And this is like 7.30 or 8 in the morning. And it's just amazing. And then the afternoon activities, you see the kids coming in on the bus from going swimming or they're playing out on the yard. 
uh, and they're always organized um, and doing uh, group things too and it, it's it's just a blessing it really is and I have a really good working relationship with them from the Mana Center and um, kudos I couldn't say enough good about them what else Don, I think what happened when you took over is you actually opened it up for bids and found out there no was no there wasn't <laughs> anybody who it. Well, and that was it, the thing is it like it never been done until we were we. I remember it stuck out was like, does this mean we've got to go out to bid with the boys and girls club because you know if it was we want to be in violation of the state code, right. and so we tried and it was kind of like um, there's nobody that can do it. You know, um, furthermore, there uh, you know other than baseball and soccer which has their own entities that covers that but at the time softball had an entity that ran softball and it dissolved and they came to the city and yep. you know luckily the boys and girls club stepped up and took it on for us because or that would have possibly went away um and this was all during this time as well so um you're exactly right we it was it was tough yeah yes i remember when i mean when chris took over it was in where the occasions is now that's where <laughs> boys and girls club runs right chris I mean, it was limited, but it served its function, and only from the generosity of the townspeople uh, of, of donating did we uh, get to build the building over by the Mana Center. And at the grand opening, I'll never forget, it was full of kids, like mad, playing the foosball and all these different games, and I went up to a group of them and said, well, you know, we've decided, I don't know if you all have heard, but we're going to change the name to the Girls and Boys Club. <laughs> and oh my goodness, they just, well, the girls were excited because they were going to come first, but the boys were not too excited. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, it's just a little inside. But Madam it's Mayor, a great organization. Unless there are any other comments, um, I, I think I'd like to say we, we thank you, <laughs> and I'd like to make a motion, unless there are other comments. Second. Okay. Then um, thank you. Place I uh, move that we place ordinance number 2105 on its first and only reading, suspending the rules and reading by title only. Thank second. You. We have a motion and a second. second. Roll call. Carol? Yes. Sappington? Yes. Smiley? Yes. Burns? Yes. Hunt? Yes. Rissler? Yes. Allen? Yes. Motion is approved. Phillips? Ordinance number 2105, an ordinance authorizing the allocation of city funds to the local chapter of the Boys and Girls Club for youth sporting programs without competitive bidding. Thank you. And just one quick comment real quick before I ask for a motion to adopt. I want to give kudos to Don Clark for his commitment to this program also. He has worked with Chris for a long time. <laughs> I have a 22-year-old grandson that still calls him coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he impacts lives uh, along with Chris. So thank you all. So any other comments from the board? If not, I will ask for a motion to adopt Ordinance 2102. So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Sappington. Yes. Smiley. Yes. Burns. Yes. Hunt. Yes. Rissler? Yes. Allen? Yes. Carroll? Yes. Motion to adopt is approved. Next items on our agenda are the staff reports. Philip? Thank you, Madam Mayor. You have the uh, January financials. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or comments, please, please feel free to contact myself or Christina. I have um, a number of expenditures to report to the board. Uh, in the police department, we did a sole source purchase uh, in the amount of $44,066.10. It was an upgrade to our in-car camera video system for storage of those videos. We had originally included $26,307 uh, $26, in the capital budget. Uh, the in-house uh, upgrade, the cost was uh, more than that. Uh, but we had some money, additional monies in the vehicle uh, allocation within capital, and so we added that additional money to that to get to the 44000 But this is an upgrade to a system called WatchGuard, and what it, that is is a software platform, and we're moving from a physical in-house server to a cloud-based server. 
and there are a number of reasons to do that that make everything much more efficient. Uh, so that's the, uh, I have to report uh, not only the purchase due to being over $30,000, but also because we so sourced it. The other purchases uh, I had mentioned uh, in previous uh, discussions about emergency expenditures related to the winter storm. Uh, the police department's eight-year-old backup generator failed during the winter storm. Uh, the cost to repa replace their damaged components was quoted at just under $25,000, and they would give us a one-year warranty on those damaged components. Uh, the chief uh, looked around, and he found a uh, quotes for a brand new generator ranging from thirty-two dollars to $37,000. And so in lieu of repairing an eight-year-old generator, uh, we determined that it was in the best interest of the city to replace the generator with a brand new one. Uh, we would get um, uh, a two-year warranty out of it, plus the technicians are local rather than being in Fort Smith. <coughs> so with that, uh, the second quote, lowest quote was $32,000, $32,282. Uh, that was from PR Power, excuse me, that included the five-year warranty and the service technicians were in Springdale. The lowest quote was uh, the $32,628, or excuse me, lower than that, second lowest quote, but that only included a two-year warranty. So I apologize for that miscommunication. The other expenditure was in the public works. Uh, the extreme code coupled with a brief power outage caused two of our pumps to crack and the, those pumps moved sludge from the holding tank to the dewatering process. Uh, the replacement cost of those two pumps were $45,116.19. Both of those purchases through emergency declaration uh, will automatically uh, amend the budget. So I want to report that. I also, uh, speaking of damage related to the winter storm, the winter storm is gonna cause more potholes. Uh, when that water gets in the cracks in the asphalt and it freezes, uh, you know, short periods of time, it still damages. We always have potholes coming into the spring, but we're gonna have more potholes in Salem Springs this spring than we've had in a long time. Every city is going to have the same problem. It's not just Salem Springs. So if um, you hear of pothole complaints, please pass them on. Please ask or uh, recommend uh, it, citizens to get online on the report a problem to report those. All I'm asking is to give us time to get around because we're going to have a lot of potholes to repair um, and they're going to they're going to show up in places that we haven't had potholes in the past. I already know I've already given a dozen or so to staff uh, to start putting on the list, but just bear with us. We're going to get them all uh, patched, but it's going to take a little bit of time. We're not going to be able to do it as quickly as we normally would hope to do that. Today, the fire department, uh, in working with uh, Benton County, held a COVID vaccine uh, clinic. Uh, we originally started out at 1,000 vaccines. We ended up with, I think, just right at 1,200 vaccinations. They were starting at eight and went to five today. Uh, there were some concerns expressed to me about traffic. I think they did a great job, and I want to thank the fire department uh, for working that clinic. I, I know there was some uh, additional traffic on Sherry Whitlock over there. You, you moved into the New Life Church. Uh, and you sort of went through a bunch of lines to fill out your paperwork, you moved over to Fire Station 1 to get your shot, and then you moved over to the softball baseball complex to do your 15 minutes of waiting. Uh, but I thought the, uh, the logistics and the execution of that went very, very well, and we were very happy to do that for our residents. Uh, so all of those are the first shot, and so everybody that's uh, got that first shot, those 1,200 people will be uh, scheduled to get the second shot a couple of weeks later. But I do want to thank the fire department because they did an excellent job, in my opinion, through the logistics of trying to manage that program. I've told you in the past that the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement uh, aren't, is not rather uh, updating their numbers that I have previously been given to you in those charts. Uh, typically, that's because uh, what I've been told is that there are fewer number of tests of COVID happening. So fewer number of tests uh, increases the uh, 
the, the percentage of error in those, uh, you know, how many are positive and whatnot, so they aren't updating those numbers. Uh, I did present you with a chart off their website on the seven-day rolling average of daily active cases per 1,000 individuals by region, and you can see that throughout Arkansas and including the Northwest region, uh, back around uh, November, end of November, we were very high up into the uh, eight or nine uh, 10 uh, daily active cases per thousand and now we're down to uh, just under two. So the numbers are coming down. I would remind everybody and, and uh, ask them to remember that we aren't out of the pandemic yet. We still need to wear our mask. We still need to wash our hands. We still need to watch our distance. In talking to the school district and to JBU, they're seeing the same thing. They're seeing lower number of positive cases than they have in recent times. So all of those are positive measures, but I do think we have to still be uh, cautious and, and continue to do what we need to do. The only other thing that I have is um, as it relates to whether or not Governor Hutchinson removes the mask mandate on the 31st of this month. Um, currently today, uh, at the beginning of the month, Governor Hutchinson removed the mandates for uh, gatherings. So he opened up, uh, you know, restaurants to uh, different capacities and what had been done before. Those mandates moved to recommendations. He's still recommending social distancing and, and those precautions. Should the governor remove the mandate for mask but continue to recommend mask, I would, uh, with no objections from the board, recommend that we continue to operate the board meeting like we are currently doing, requesting everybody to wear a mask when they enter, uh, maintaining the six-foot social distancing until we come out officially out the other side. Um, it is, uh, in my opinion, even though the mandates would be removed if the recommendation stays in place, I would believe it would be appropriate for the city to continue to follow that recommendation. Madam Mayor, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, next is our director's reports, and since we are sitting in our old order tonight, we are going to also do our director's reports in that. So, Mindy, we will start with you, and then David, we will end with you. Okay. Thank you to the city and the fire department for organizing and coordinating and implementing that vaccine clinic today. I know there were 1,200 people that were very thankful to have the opportunity to get those vaccines. Um, also, just real quickly, I, I want to uh, thank you for the additional information that you've been putting under the fiscal impact on purchases recently. Um, it's, it's helpful to have spelled out there that these purchases were already approved in the budget and where the money's coming from, how it's being arranged. Anyway, I just appreciate that additional information. I, I think that's very helpful. Um, I've been one that's harped from the very beginning on just communicating, 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 and I feel like we do continue to improve on that from announcing on social media when the meetings are coming and, um, uh, you know, linking to the agendas to providing this extra information uh, under fiscal policies. I, I think we are continuing to provide ways for people to get the information. We can't force them to read the information, but if they want it, um, I, I, I think there are many ways to get it. Thank you also for the insert in the utility bill recently. Um, that's just another way that, that citizens have to be able to contact us and another way that I think we're, we're showing our desire to get that feedback and input. So um, we, we want it uh, and now, now it's in your court <laughs> to provide it. So as, as citizens, just uh, reach out to us. So thank you. Oh, and one more thing. It was really nice on my way here. I, I drive down Benton Street. Really nice to see so many people out and enjoying the park. Um, we have some, some great facilities here, and people were taking advantage of those. And uh, so thank you. Brad. Yes, we still have several uh, assistance programs still available for those that are in need, so make sure uh, city websites posted those or reach out to a board member so you can access those. And uh, I thank the city staff uh, 
I think the board's going to get overwhelmed with the pothole situation. And once again, Southern Building Code type stuff doesn't work in uh, Antarctic conditions. So uh, it's a statewide and it's a national problem. So make sure you filter it properly. And we're a little bit behind on a few projects. Uh, but I'm sure uh, you understand the city staff is overwhelmed. And I'd just like to see us uh, finish strong and maybe go uh, the extra mile and uh, uh, as regard to COVID. Um, and some of the principles that uh, are practices that we've been uh, established are what we learned in kindergarten about washing your hands and things like that. And those, those go a long, long way. And I'd like to see, uh, uh, especially this facility here, maintain some of those sanitizing practices. I, I think it's just good practice and we set an example for the community. Marla, the mayor. Um, I just wanna encourage everybody that Thursday night at the library at six is gonna be the um, public input session for the community meeting. And we have surveys that are available online or you can get those from most of the directors or find uh, the Mana Center and I have copies. We'll be glad to give you some if you do not have the ability to do that um, at your home. And also you can go to the library. And I think Don also said that they had a kiosk at his office where you could go ahead and take the survey there. And uh, I believe that the meeting is also gonna be virtual. You can get that through, is it gonna be through Siloam Springs 2040 or is it gonna be through the? For the virtual, for the virtual uh, participation Thursday. Yeah, there will be a link on that website for that, but it'll be similar to the board meeting. I think it runs on a YouTube platform if I'm not mistaken. But yes. Okay, wonderful. So that gives us all the opportunity to input if we still are afraid to get out. Correct. And thank you. Uh, cleanup week is approaching. The dates for it are, Mr. Patterson? <laughs> is it the 28th, the week of the 28th, I think? Steve. Started the 29th, Steve, I think. Step up to the microphone, please. Uh -huh. Yes, help us. Oh, yes, Mr. G. <laughs> it's whatever the, the last week of March is. Okay. 26th, 9th. Starts the 29th. The 29th, 29th is the go. Monday, 28th is Sunday. There you go. Beth. You're going to have this just keep coming off the phone. Yeah. I'm sure he has a few more things going. <laughs> I asked Glenn that. I think today's the 16th, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you wear green tomorrow, okay. <laughs> Uh, had the opportunity to go to <laughs> bingo last night, saw uh, the community in action, Jerry Cavanis sang uh, the national anthem for us, so got us all started, so it was pretty, pretty fun. Um, also, I reached out to John Bowles uh, with the Parks and Rec because I wanted to know what kind of events were upcoming for um, us because the weather's really nice and spring breaks next week and he has listed um, and made a flyer on his website, also on Facebook, that lists out some of the activities. For instance, they're gonna have a bike fest and it's going to be March the 20th, 10 a.m. They're gonna have activities out there. They'll be checking your bikes for safety. They have hot dogs and other things like that. So I think it'd be fun. And then they're gonna do a kite day, April the 3rd, and then it just blows up. So I encourage you to look on the city's calendar or also um, the Facebook page for Parks and Rec. And I continue to ask you all to reach out to us. I think it's very important that the community get in touch with us. Now you have our numbers and you can do that to me through text or a phone call. Also, if you have any groups or organizations that's doing some activities for the community, uh, reach out to us and we can help 
share that information for you because there's so much to do in our town and uh, we need to get the word out. We need to all uh, share and appreciate in our beautiful surroundings. And that's all. Hello. You're welcome. Lisa. I wanna say thank you to Mr. Lester and Philip for putting it together for the presentation on the municipal fiber opti optic internet. I'm excited to see the potential for that um, project in Salem Springs. The IT nerd in me is coming out on that, on that project. Um, thank you, Philip and staff, for quickly responding to the calls and concerns I received in the last two weeks. You guys have, I mean, your turnaround is amazing. So, and I can't thank you enough. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You know, tomorrow is uh, St. Patrick's Day. And I'm glad for it in and of itself. But whenever I see St. Patrick's Day, I know we're also six weeks away, so it didn't matter what Punxsutawney Fields did or didn't do. Spring's coming. Looking forward to it. And Chris, we appreciate what the Boys and Girls Club is doing for this community and for the children, for our next generation. Thank you. Well, I too want to thank John Lester for the presentation because it really gave me some insight onto what we might be able to uh, accomplish and how we could go about it, some of the steps. I want to thank Chris and your staff for your dedication to the children of Siloam Springs. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I know that Brad was talking about some of the assistance that we have that's on our website, but one of them is the rental assistance, and I think that's probably important to a lot of our residents here. And it's the HARC, and you can see that on our website, or you can call 211 and receive some information. And that funds is good through the 31st of December or until it runs out. I also want to thank the Siloam Springs Fire Department, Benton County Emergency Management, and Call Your Drug for the uh, COVID vaccination today. I have been to Kite Day before. It's very interesting. It's a lot of fun. And it is April the 3rd, and it's from 10 to 12. Kids will be making kites and flying, and also it will be touch the truck. The other thing that you can check out on our website are some safety measures during this storm that uh, comes through the spring. And I think tomorrow we're looking at maybe having some storms, so you might want to check that out. It is always wonderful to see everybody out and about when the weather is nice. Salem Springs has some great facilities and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. David? Yeah, speaking of uh, bad weather, there was uh, what I read on that service that we get fill up on our emails is that there's the potential of golf, si golf ball size hail. So just be aware anywhere from tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, there could be hail. Um, Philip, I was just going to ask, you brought up potholes, and something I've noticed in the last couple years, I'm not sure if we've changed material that we put in a pothole, but it seems like after one's been done, not long, I see pieces of it laying around the hole, like they, like the materials come out or something, and I, don't, I didn't know if, it's just something I wanted you to know about in case, I don't know if it's something different or what. Um, I thought it was fantastic that you invited Mr. Lester to come. Philip and I appreciate it. He was very, definitely very knowledgeable, um, and and is not just intelligence knowledgeable, but he has practical knowledge, having done this. And it's great to hear his experience. Um, lastly, I just want to tell everyone: if you have never been to a website called OnlyInYourState.com, all one word: Only in Your State, and look up Arkansas. It is amazing how many lists that Siloam Spring is, is on for best small towns in the state, best small towns in America, best small town, best, best town for this or that. And I think uh, from all the ones that they have, we by far are on, are, are listed more times of different lists than any other city I saw. So it's kind of interesting just to go and see, especially what they have to say for us. And of course, a huge, huge um, part of that goes to how great our city runs and operates and, and uh, 
the quality of life that our staff uh, provides to the citizens. And with that, I will say a motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have that? You know, motion and a second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. <laughs>